Okay, so thank you very much. So, so yesterday was very uh, broad, quick, uh, but I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation of a simple example in Schubert Calculus. I hope it gives you a flavor for, for what kind of questions or what kind of techniques uh, you might see in the area. Um, but as I said yesterday, uh, starting today, uh, and in particular today, you will not see very much of Schubert calculus at all. Um, I would like, so one of the very main uh, fundamental technical tools for what I want to talk about later is what is called goresky kotwitz mcpherson theory, often abbreviated GKM theory. Um, and I should not, I know that some of you here are already very expert in, in that uh, uh, area, so I apologize uh, to those people, but uh, I, sh I did not want to assume that you have seen that. So today will be, <laughs> so today will be exactly this. And then hopefully starting tomorrow, we will discuss uh, more more precisely the relation, the intersection of the Schubert calculus and the GCAM theory. But today, really, I want to be broad and tell you, uh, tell you just generally what is equivalent cohomology and what is GCAM. So, um, but before I do that, uh, which is to say jump into the specific definitions, I want at least to motivate <coughs> why it is related to Schubert calculus, so which is to say why it is related to what we spoke yesterday. So, um, I will be very brief and vague here, but at least so that you have in your mind why I speak about this. So why is this related? Related or relevant to, anyway, uh, Schubert calculus. Okay, and um, well, the main uh, point is one of the last portions of yesterday's introduction. Uh, you saw that, in fact, all that I did for yesterday's problem is to translate an enumerative geometric question into just a computation in a graded ring, namely the cohomology ring of, of the Grassmannian. So you already saw yesterday that, well, it is really a cohomology ring that we want to compute. And so, um, so, so we've already seen yesterday how I can translate an enumerative question um, translate or can translate maybe can translate to a computation in a cohomology ring. Okay, but yesterday I said nothing about an equivalent cohomology ring. We only spoke about the ordinary cohomology ring uh, in the classical sense. Um, so, so now I want to say, so the idea then from here is, well, it often turns out, and I will be much more specific, specific as the day goes on, uh, when the spaces in question for example, the Grassmannian, uh, but but this is this is a more general statement. When the spaces in question actually come equipped with a nice action of a, of some group, a compact Lie group, often um, often a compact torus, although I don't insist on that for for today. Um, when the spaces in question uh, come equipped with a nice and I, I will be much more specific about that uh, adjective later, uh, with a nice uh, group action, um, then it's in fact often useful to do, uh, to do equivalent cohomology instead. And one of the main reasons is, well, okay, so if you are sufficiently nice, then in fact the equivalent cohomology ring surjects onto the ordinary cohomology ring. So somehow you are doing even more computations. And so if you can do the equivalent computation, you, are, you should be able to do the ordinary. You have the surjective map. 
Um, and secondly, I will write all this down, and secondly, it turns out that because you have this extra group action, uh, there are many techniques available, including GCAM theory, uh, which in fact allow you to do very concrete computations. Um, which, which are not, and these techniques are not available when you only think about the ordinary cohomology. So this is the main idea. Let me write that, what I just said. Okay, so with a nice group action, it is often useful to do equivariant cohomo uh, no hyphen, sorry, equivariant <laughs> cohomology. Uh, computations instead so under this un under uh, sufficiently nice conditions um, so if nice so if nice enough then uh, one this is what I first said one has a surjection Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. So I guess I should have some notation. Uh, so, oh, and G. I'm so used to writing T. I write T. Sorry. So G. So, so if, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so let's see. Okay, so if I have a G acting on M, which, as I say, uh, is nice enough. I will say more about that. Uh, then you have a surjection. I'll say more about coefficients in a moment. Okay, and um, there are many powerful techniques for computing this, which somehow disappear when you are only thinking about that. So for computing uh, this. Okay, so this is the broad motivation. Um, okay, very good. And needless to say, uh, in Schubert calculus, we are thinking about objects like the Grassmannian, the flag variety, and so on, um, various uh, compact groups. And I, I can just tell you right now that in those cases, in fact, the, the whatever these nice conditions are, they will hold. So that is why this uh, setup and these ideas are relevant and related to what we discussed yesterday. But I will start saying that more specifically tomorrow. Okay, so in particular, so note um, uh, the situation in Schubert calculus will be nice, I promise you. <laughs> but we will speak about that more tomorrow. Satisfies. niceness. Okay, but, okay. So that is just in answer to this question. Okay. All right. So with that being said, again, uh, I will now speak very broadly. Uh, just This is just a classical equivariant topology plus a slightly more modern ideas. Okay, so as I said earlier, let's now, put ourselves in this uh, rather broad situation. I will take any compact Lie group, G. Okay. Um, I will suppose that I have just some smooth group action of G. So suppose G acts on M uh, is a smooth, so, so if M is a smooth manifold, and G, the Lie group, acts smoothly on it. Okay, so this is usual situation. Okay, I, I, now I want to just tell you what equivariant cohomology is, but again, before I do that, I would like at least to give some motivation for why it is defined the way it is defined, um, in case you have not seen it before. If you have not seen it, then you just see the definition and you say, what is the meaning of that? So, I, uh, so in case some people here have not seen the definition, let me motivate. Okay, so roughly the idea Um, uh, recurvate homology should be is that the equivalent cohomology should be nothing other than the ordinary cohomology of just the quotient space, the orbit space of M under this G action. 
Yeah, so that, that is somehow the, the, the uh, how can I say, version zero of acrobatic cohomology is, is, that, is that idea. So is that, um, so whatever this symbol ought to mean uh, is that, so as I say, this, this is incorrect. <laughs> Uh, or sometimes not correct, um, but, but that, this is the idea you should have in mind, is ought to be just the ordinary cohomology of the quotient. Okay. Um, but why is that bad? Well, it's bad precisely because oftentimes, uh, if, if so, well, so for example, if G does not act freely, then that quotient can have very bad singularities and, and, and that is somehow not what you want. So if the G action is not free, then M mod G can be quite bad. So that's why this version zero, uh, although it is, the it is the motivating idea, it is not quite the correct thing. You don't just set H G of M by definition to be the ordinary cohomology of M mod G. However, the solution is actually available to us. The solution to this problem, so let's see. Uh, okay, so here, is, so here is the problem, problem. Okay, so that's the problem with this uh, version zero definition. And the solution to this problem is to just introduce a, um, a new space on which G acts, where you have not changed the original action too much. It is still homotopy equivalent to the original space, um, but now the action is free. So this is, the, this is the point. Okay, so the solution is to force the action to be free without changing the original manifold too much, uh, without changing the homotopy type. Okay, um, so let me just label this with a star, and I will tell you when we have managed to do this. Okay, so here's, so here's a fact. So I, I don't, I apologize uh, if this is the first time you've seen it. I, I will just put the next thing up as a fact. Um, one, can, one, one can actually say some more words about it, but today I will just state it as a fact. Uh, for any such compact Lie group, yeah, so for any compact Lie group, there exists, so this is what I mean. I will not prove it, but I just assert there exists a principle G bundle, which is um, traditionally denoted as follows, EG over BG. So in particular, when I say it is the principal G bundle, I mean that G is acting freely on this total space EG. So there is that free action. Okay. So G is acting freely, of course. Okay. Um, with uh, EG, this total space being contractible. Okay, so both of these words should uh, tell you that, there's, that uh, this will be relevant for solving this problem. This is contractible, so there's no topology there, and it's free, and I wanted a free action, yeah? Okay, so now, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so before, uh, always you should do the simplest example. So, for G being S1, uh, I can tell you explicitly what these are, ES1, is the so-called infinite sphere, and BS1 is CP infinity. So you see they are infinite dimensional. We have to pay a price uh, somehow in, the, in how complicated the space is why that it is infinite dimensional, but uh, it is still very, very, uh, how can I say, we can handle these spaces, okay? Um, and, and, and by the way, the projection is the half, half map. Okay, all right, very good. So now let's solve the problem and, um, and, and address this. So, so instead of, so because um, in general this M mod G can be quite bad, instead of thinking about the action of G on M, I will instead think about 
the action. Uh, sorry, the diagonal. G, oops, the uh, G action on M cross E G. Yes. Um, just take the sphere in a Hilbert space, say, in an infinite, infinite dimensional Hilbert space, for example. Uh, that's an analysis proof, yeah? Yeah, it's, it's, it's I think, um, I forget where it is, but it's a, it's a fairly standard uh, real analysis fact, or functional analysis. Or whatever, but yes. Okay. Uh, okay, very good. Okay, so, so I will now consider instead the diagonal G action. Um, and and this, was, this is the point. Uh, so now, since EG is contractible, I have not changed. I have not changed the topology. This this piece is just. I'm not adding any topology. It's the same as that. Homotopy. Uh, the homotopy type is the same as that. But now, because G acts on this piece freely, it acts on the whole thing freely. Okay. So so this. Uh, let's see. So this accomplishes what I set out to do. Very good. And now, so now I, I, I know that the quotient will be a reasonable space, and I define to be, well, now that I have something where the action is free, I will define it to be the quotient. By that diagonal action. And just, uh, just, um, Notational convention, uh, uh, most places that I have seen this denote this by this. So, but people disagree on exactly how this should be notated. But anyway, this, it's, it's, it's this, it's the quotient by the diagonal action. And by the way, notation or terminology, this is uh, always called the Borel construction. This right there is called the Borel construction. Okay. Okay, so now I try this. <laughs> All right, here we go. This one. Uh, how about how about I answer the question while this is going? Is that or is it going to be too loud? No, I'm asking Okay. Oh, so I shouldn't erase. Yes. Okay. Um, maybe the experts in the audience can help. I'm not, I think it, uh, so my guess, uh, so this is, this is just a guess. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure about a precise state. My guess, my first gut instinct is that I'm sure it depends on the non-compact group. Um, but maybe, Professor Sai, maybe you have. Um, I don't have, but usually when you talk about non-compact groups, it's very wide. Well, hang on. Okay, maybe we should have this discussion later. I just, I'm not sure when you say, "Well, any proper action is fine." No, no, I'm no, not. No, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's fine. At least that's a minimum. Yeah, but I think just because it's proper it doesn't mean that you wouldn't. Yeah, and, and what I yeah, and what I meant about what kind of non-compact group you have, I mean, so for example, you know, is it is it reductive? You know, I mean, how, what kind of bad non-compact group do you? I think we should have this discussion maybe uh, individually uh, later. Yeah, because I think I think it's a real can of worms, as we say in, in American English. <laughs> yeah. That is also an excellent question. Um, I think here I, 
Here, I think it could be disconnected, I think. I think. For this, I think it's okay. The definition is still valid. I'm fairly certain. O -O oh, let's see. Oh, am I mistaken? Yes, and then, and then is this... Uh, You can construct all this E and even for the screen group and for the That's right. true, yes. Yes, I think it's yes. But then I guess I just didn't remember whether the usual construction will actually give you something. Yeah, I think it's okay. I think that this so the, the, the issue of disconnected groups has been plaguing me for many years now. But I think for this it's okay. But I would be, depending on why you asked the question, I would be actually very happy to talk to you more about it. But, um, <laughs> well, you were late. <laughs> um, so, so one, so this is a complete aside, but perhaps some of the experts would be interested. Um, so there are many symplectic geometric techniques. Um, like, for example, Kerwin subjectivity, things like that, that, that actually deal with equifrant cohomology um, and give you very, well, some very powerful techniques for computing ordinary cohomology of symplectic quotients. But those, many of those symplectic theorems are actually only for connected groups. Is that it's actually very important that it's just for connected groups. And the reason is, again, I apologize, this is for the experts, but, um, but it's because the moment map only encodes the Lie algebra information, so you actually only have the information about the connected component of the identity. Um, so there's a, there's been a, there's a long-standing issue about how much of symplectic geometry, sort of equivalent symplectic geometry, uh, in, in this context translates to disconnected groups. And that's actually, I think, a very subtle question. So, so you asked, so you asked and I said, well, <laughs> but through this, I think it's okay. <laughs> Anything I think else? I think, the yeah, I think this is okay. I think this is okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, am I allowed to press this button? Okay, here we go. <laughs> and I guess I erased yeah, this part right. myself, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Have to erase by yourself. <laughs> but I guess okay. Okay. All uh, right. So oh, can people hear me? This is also an issue, I guess. Uh, okay. So I promised when I wrote this that I would say a few words about coefficients. So this is again also a comment that is maybe a little bit more for the experts, but I feel I should say it. Um, so, okay. Um, so, in general, um, um, everything I said so far, there's nothing preventing you from using any coefficient system you like. Yeah. So, of course, um, we can use. Um, Um, and so what I want to do is make just one remark and then I will restrict for the, my talk to the easiest case which is complex. Okay, but I just want to make sure that everybody is aware that um, in general, in fact it's a rather interesting and, and, and subtle question as to which parts of what I will say in the following, in fact, applies for the other coefficients. Yeah, so, but I will stick to the easiest situation where I am sure everything holds. But in general, it's actually interesting and, and in fact, quite subtle. Uh, so, in general, it is both, uh, well, interesting and quite subtle um, uh, as to, um, to determine to determine uh, which parts of the theory um, I described below um, uh, 
applies to Okay, so that's one comment. And in fact, as long as I'm going to make this comment, I also, in fact, ought to make the, uh, the following comment, which is, in fact, there's nothing preventing you from asking, well, if, it, if some, some kinds of theories, like Chikam theory, which I will describe, uh, applies to, say, Borel aquaferent cohomology, um, using this traditional definition, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, this, this tr definition using the Borel construction, there's nothing preventing you, if you're an aquaferent topologist, from asking me, well, what about the other aquaferent cohomology theory? What about, you know, uh, equivalent K-theory? What about algebraic K-theory? What about, you know, equivalent cobordism, if you're really fancy, et cetera, et cetera. There's nothing preventing you from asking this. And so let me say, just as a, as a remark, um, that um, various people have studied um, which parts uh, are applicable to, for example, equivalent K-theory and, and algebraic K-theory. And there is literature out there. Um, so if you are interested, just please ask me later. Um, and in moreover, in fact, moreover, or in fact, we can ask similarly um, for other for other generalized equivalent cohomology theories. And the primary example that most people have in mind would be equivariant, so the topological equivariant K-theory, although, of course, algebraic geometers would also talk about algebraic uh, equivariant K-theory. But anyway, um, this is the primary one that people often ask me, um, and so I just put this in this remark. Okay, very good. Um, but I, I, I will stick to the easiest case. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, so I should say that. <laughs> so for what follows... Uh, I will take that, okay? All right. Okay, um, so we made the definition, so now there's a reality check. Okay, so what, I mean, what do I mean by reality check? I mean simply, well, let's just make sure that this agrees with our intuition. Uh, in the sense that uh, I think it was somewhere around here uh, where I wrote that, well, somehow the initial gut, gut uh, feeling is that it should give you the cohomology of the quotient if the, if the action is free. So let's just uh, observe that if, um, what am I trying to say? So, so you might imagine if the G action was free, then you didn't need to do any of this complicated nonsense with the uh, EG over BG. So, so what I just want to say is if this actually was free, okay, then please observe that even if I do this complicated construction, in fact, it will just give you the ordinary cohomology of that quotient. And the reason is, if you think about what I just said, what you should do, you have m cross e, so I, maybe I just uh, uh, say it, you have m cross eg, yeah, um, and then you quotient by the G action, but the, both of the actions are free. Yeah, so what do you have? Well, you, what you end up with is an EG fiber bundle over M mod G. And then the EG, the fiber is contractible, so of course topologically it is the same as the quotient. So here, um, so here you, are, you are in fact achieving what you set out to do, okay? All right, on the other hand, so that's, that's reality check number one, yeah? Okay, but then uh, on the other hand, at the other extreme, and this is also very important, so this is why I want to put it on the board. Yeah, yeah sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. At the other extreme, if um, I have a tr completely trivial action, okay, completely trivial action, G acts on a point. That's the other extreme, of course. I couldn't be more trivial than that. Okay. Then, well, if you follow the definition, you will get precisely the uh, ordinary cohomology of BT. 
Okay, the classifying space. And here, because I will use it so many times uh, in the next today and in the next week, let's write it up for the first time. Let me repeat one more time that for most of this week, my group will be a torus. Okay, so um, the special case is, uh, so at the n-dimensional compact torus, which I will think of as just the usual circle uh, to the nth uh, power, then we actually just did this example maybe over there. Yeah, so again, if I have Tn acting trivial on a point, then this observation says, okay, so I'm getting the uh, classifying space of Tn. That's just the n-fold product of Cp infinity. And so I'm getting a polynomial ring. Maybe I just write it like this. Okay, so this was BS1. I just write it as CP infinity. Uh, and then it's to the nth power. So this is just, and please remember now I'm going to just restrict to C coefficients. So my coefficients are C. And then it's a polynomial ring in n variables. Okay. So unlike ordinary cohomology, so unlike the ordinary singular cohomology of a point, which is quite simple, it's just C. Instead, I have a very rich ring. It's the polynomial ring. Okay, so, okay, um, very good. And fi uh, final remark, small remark, is that, so what this is telling me is that any equivalent cohomology ring, if I have a TN action on some manifold M, then uh, this is automatically, so this is, the, this is the coefficient ring of the cohomology theory. So any equivalent cohomology ring is in fact on H, so it's the polynomial ring module. It has that module structure. Okay. All right. So. It's okay. Okay. So that's what I wish to say just uh, to set up for Ecovert cohomology. Now let's uh, proceed to what I was advertising, which is, okay, here we are. We have, we have built what looks to be a slightly, uh, well, not slightly, <laughs> uh, somehow significantly algebraically more uh, richer uh, structure by introducing this rich co uh, coefficient ring. Um, so now, maybe it's more complicated than cohomology. Maybe we have a very difficult time computing it. And the answer is, well, actually, it's the opposite. We have an easier time to compute it. So let me try to justify this uh, statement. So now let's try to compute. Okay. So I give you the somehow the mantra, the uh, the 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 the, what's the word, the advertisement or the commercial maybe for, for this. Um, and I get, I get it from my colleague Tara Holmes uh, paper. So it, she has a expository paper with this title and I like it so much I can't help but use it here. Uh, her, it's at globally, compute locally. So what this is going to mean so, and so if you want more details on what I say, please go and have a look at her paper uh, which, with this title. So this is actually Tara Holm, it's on the archive. Okay, so, so what this is supposed to mean is we are, what we are going to do is a, 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 a well-known technique, it's called localizing to the t-fixed points. So let me say what this means. Okay, so now, from now on, I will focus on the G being the torus case, because that's the only case we care about for Schubert calculus. Okay, so from now on, <coughs> take, so I just restrict to this case. Okay, compact torus. Okay, very good. Okay, so there are various pieces. Uh, yes, sorry. Is, is the case of torus just a special case? That's an excellent question. So in, in, many, in many situations, let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous here. In, um, thank you. Well, okay, so um, 
it is, I'm forgetting some technical details, which is why I'm having trouble to come out and say. So in many situations, uh, it is the case that the equivalent cohomology can be computed as the vial invariance of the T equivariant cohomology. So, um, so I'm sorry. So, so, so for a compact Lie group G, take T to be its maximal torus, and then the so in many situations the G equivariant cohomology will be precisely the T equivariant cohomology for the maximal torus inside of G, and then you know what is the vial group. So it's the it's the normalizer of the torus mod the torus. So this is, a, a, this is a Lie theoretic gadget, which I get from the compact group. So of course you don't expect that, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that you don't expect that just the maximal torus should encode all the information of the compact Lie group. But the, point, but the point of what I'm saying is, but if you remember the action of the vial group, which is something that lives in the broader group, not just the torus, and then you take the vial invariance, then in fact uh, you will get something that is isomorphic to the equivalent cohomology. Uh, uh, sorry, 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 the G equivalent cohomology. Yeah? Maybe I should write this? Okay, so. Um, the vial group is not a torus. No, it's not. It's not. Uh, example, okay, example, example. Uh, let's take GLN, or, or the unitary group. I'm, I'm doing compact groups, I'm sorry. Uh, unitary group. The maximal torus is the diagonal subgroup inside the unitary group, and the vial group is the permutation group. It's very non abelian. Yeah? And my statement is, in general, uh, so under many circumstances, and the precise statement is what I'm forgetting, but, but un under many circumstances, this will be true. What is this? G is the maximal... Uh, okay, so, so, so G is compact Lie. T is its maximal torus. I mean, take the vial invariance. I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, ba ba backtrack, I apologize. Okay, so, so, um, so the vial group, okay, the vial group is by definition, so it's the normalizer inside of G of T. Is that something so familiar, okay? And then modulo the torus. So that's definition of what is the vial group. So this is sitting inside, so, so this is sitting inside of G. Yeah? And so what I'm trying to say is that there, there is a way to think about um, how, how, how this vial group should act on this object. And my statement is that if you take the vial invariance of this ring, you will get a ring which is isomorphic to the geocorrent cohomology of M. So in that sense, uh, if, you if you know how to compute the T equivalent cohomology, then it is sufficient to determine the G equivalent cohomology in many circumstances. And again, I apologize. Th there are issues with exactly which coefficients. I think it's harder with Z coefficients and so on and so forth. So I'm sorry, but, but many times this is true. Okay? I should say, however, <laughs> um, I mean, so this answers in principle uh, a question, which is, well, if I want to do G, can I always reduce to T? And well, in principle, maybe yes, but of course, uh, the thing to remember is that it's always, it might be hard to compute what is exactly the vial, a vial action. And it might also be hard to figure out exactly what are the invariants. So this is, this is an answer in principle somehow. Uh, but anyway, it is at least an answer. Yeah, okay. Um, very good. It's an excellent question. And it's actually also, well, never mind. I, I incorrectly claimed once in my life that, um, that the equivalent K theory should always be the T equivalent K theory vial invariance, and that was incorrect. So this is, I'm very, very sensitive about this issue. <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, thankfully, one of my colleagues caught the uh, mistake in the paper before we even sent it to a journal. So we, <laughs> anyway, very good. Um, may I continue? Yes, okay, very good. Okay, so, um, so with, that, with that being said, uh, let, uh, please allow me to restrict to this special case. Um, and now, what I wanted to say earlier is I have divided the discussion quite explicitly into two pieces. One, I want to talk about this localization business, which I will explain right now. Um, and then, secondly, the Goreski-Kotwitz-McPherson theory. And let me just say a word about why I organized this way. 
Um, it's precisely because, hopefully next week I explain to you some of my recent work with Juliana Tomatsko, and the fundamental um, problem that we encounter, she and I, with what we want to do is precisely that part one is fine for our spaces, but it's precisely part two that fails. And so what we are trying to do is somehow bridge the gap uh, between the two. So, I, so that's why I wanted to present it to you also, uh, really separating the ideas in these two pieces. So that's why I do this, okay? All right, so very good. So let's first do injectivity and the fixed points. Okay, and so by the way, this is what often gets called localization. Very good. Okay, so this is just notation. So by definition of notation, whatever, let's, let's let MT denote the T fixed points. Oh, I'm sorry, and I often forget to write the N. So I just, anyway, okay. Uh, so the T fixed points of M. Okay, so these are the points that do not move under the T action. Okay, very good. Let I denote the inclusion of the subset into M. So denote the inclusion. Okay. And so anytime I have, oh, I'm so sorry, I should say, um, so here, this is a T invariant set. T fixed point. So of course I don't move, so it's invariant. Um, and so this is in fact an equivariant map. Okay. Therefore, just functoriality and so on. Uh, therefore, I get an induced map on equivariant cohomology. So that's just, that's just notation. Very good. Okay. A classical theorem, which I believe should be due to Borel. The references that I look at say that it's by Borel. Okay, so here we go. With the assumptions, or notation if you like, as above. Okay, so I'm in this setup. Then the kernel and co-kernel of I star are torsion submodules. So please recall, this was the point of my remark here. Any equivariant cohomology ring, including this and this, automatically comes with a polynomial ring module structure. Okay? And the assertion of Borel is that, well, if I look at this, then, well, both the kernel and the co-kernel are torsion. In other words, there exists some element in this polynomial ring which will multiply it and get you zero. That's what I mean by torsion. Okay? All right. So, Another reality check. Well, hang on. What if the T action is free? That could happen. Then I don't have any fixed points. This is empty. This is nothing. Uh, sorry, I mean, that's not nothing. Sorry, this is nothing. So it's, it's a trivial ring. Sorry. So that's the whole, the whole equivalent cohomology is in the kernel and I'm claiming that it's torsion. And so this is just a reality check just to make sure we are all comfortable with what is happening. I just want to convince you that this should not, this should not be surprising at all. That of course it's torsion. And the reason that it's of course torsion is because, please remember, if the T action is free, then this equivalent cohomology is the ordinary cohomology of the quotient. And ordinary cohomology rings are always bounded in degree, whereas this is not. 
So of course, eventually you're going to multiply by something which is too high a degree for it to be non-zero in some e ordinary co-modulating, and of course you're going to be zero. Yeah. So that's just, so I just want to say this. Just you know, it's always good to make sure you're solid on your feet. Yeah. So so here we go. So if the t action is free, then of course there's no fixed points at all. Okay then we just discussed earlier that this should just be that, but that's just an ordinary Kolmage ring. It's all torsion because an ordinary Kolmage ring is bounded in degree. So of course, eventually I kick it up to some degree and it'll be zero. Okay, so this, so this, um, so I'm just saying, okay, we should be comfortable with what we are saying at the moment. Okay, so this makes sense. Uh, okay, this is just the zero map. Okay, very good, very good. Um, all right, so doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, now I just use this. Okay. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, all right. I said I would not mention Schubert calculus in this uh, today, but in fact I lied. I guess I will say one thing right now. <laughs> okay. So fact for the next uh, thing. Um, so for, so, and I'm glad that you asked the question there because I already said what the maximal torus is. So <laughs> for the maximal torus action, on uh, the varieties, so on the flag varieties, G mod P which is to say, i.e., in the setting of Schubert calculus. So, by the way, uh, this is simply a preview for tomorrow, and I will say more about these words tomorrow. So if you are not so happy with G mod P's, please, uh, we will talk about it tomorrow, okay? Uh, so in the setting of Schubert calculus. Okay. Um, in fact, is a free so that's a fact let me just say it okay why do I mention it here well I'm telling you it's free there's no torsion that means the kernel cannot be anything because after, if I had any kernel it has to be torsion I'm not I can't I don't have any torsion okay so corollary so this is why I say so a uh, corollary which is very important for us. Corollary of this theorem of Borel is precisely this. That, well, if I happen to know due to other methods, um, like for example, you know, symplectic geometric techniques using some Morse theory and so on. Doesn't have to be that, but anyway. If you happen to know using some other uh, um, theory that whatever equivalent cohomology ring you have happens to be free as an HT point module, then it tells you that I star is an inclusion. Okay, so if is a free module. Oops, I'm so sorry, not that. Free uh, HT point module. Then this I star is an injection. Okay. All right. Let me give this a name. Ah, I'm sorry. I didn't write it the way I wanted to write it. Okay. Let me write it this way. Uh, then.
Oh, I guess I had it over there. Oh, right. Okay. All right. I'm sorry? Exactly. Exactly. So if, if I know it's free, I can't have any torsion, so the kernel can't be anything. Yeah? Okay. All right. I'm sorry, I can't hear. <laughs> like, this plane yeah. is valid only when you're working over complex uh, options. Oh, are you talking about Borel? Um, no, the, the corollary. Well, certainly if I have Borel, then I have the corollary. I mean, that's, that's yeah? So the question is whether Borel is correct over, and, I, I, and for Borel, I'm working over C. Right? And what I, what's that? Borel, I'm pretty sure, is over C. At least, okay, so, so then this is again one of these questions, well, how much is it true for other coefficients? And I'm not sure. Maybe I missed why this corollary uh, is Because this is the Borel, it says corollary is quotient, but this is free, so there is no quotient. Quotient in... I-star, corollary of I-star is... Okay, let me try again. Right, so Borel tells me that whatever the kernel is, it has to be a torsion submodule. If I know in advance that there can't be any torsion in my module, then the kernel has to be zero. If the, the, if the kernel is zero, then that's, and then if the kernel is zero, that means it's injective. Right, so going from the Borel to the core layer of Borel is, is just an observation. There's no issue about, yeah? Um, and let me just say one more time, I'm confident that Borel is true over C, and I'm not confident over others, so let me, uh, I can look it up, but um, not sure right now. By the way, yes. so all aquavariant cohomologies are only, so H to, K, H to K star modules, not, not even a, so not also an algebra. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. I'm sorry, say so that, uh, algebra, so, so I, I just spoke that, so those modules are also algebras, non-commutative, might be. Sure. Always, all the time. The way the thesis is, you can do any constructive, like that. Not necessarily like, 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 you have a you have a Brumot decay and I mean modulus mm -hmm. yeah. and then you have a, a multiple multiple structure inside. Yes. Right. So it is a, it is an algebra. Yeah. It but is. The question is uh, algebra algebra structure right. is very wide. It can be very difficult. It's a, it's all like not Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. But in Schubert calculus, everything <laughs> is an even degree. <laughs> so we're very happy. Yeah? So, but, but sometimes uh, this algebra structure is, uh, more, is more subtle. Yes. yes. And also, the algebra structure detects some, like the Masuda theory. Yes. Yes. Algebra structure, homology. Algebra structure determines this. So there are some cases where algebra structure is really important. But I think basically here, module structure. That's it. Sorry for that. Not at all. It's, it's much more fun this way. Uh, okay, very good. Um, so the one comment that I wanted to make is so, Mark. I was saying earlier um, that somehow one of the philosophical reasons why we prefer to work with equivariant cohomology is precisely because we have some techniques available to us which you can't dream of in ordinary cohomology. And mm -hmm. I should have done this before I pressed the erase button. But please notice that that current, that I star map, you can't possibly expect that to be injective in ordinary cohomology. If you just erase the t's, yeah? then this is just never going to happen. For example, if mt is isolated points, 
then there's no, you're going to kill everything of higher degree. So, of course, this can't possibly be an injection. So, this is something that really happens. It's, it's the magic, if you like, of echographic homology. So, um, Um, so this is an indication, or it is a justification for my broad remark earlier, that that equivariant really is, is special in this way, and it allows you more techniques. Okay, now, but what was the point of all of this? Okay, the point exactly is that, well, so I have this injection. Great, why is it so useful? It's because, by definition, the T action on MT, the six points, is trivial. And in that case, the, if you think about the definition of equivalent cohomology with that Borel construction, you will see that, in fact, the equivalent cohomology of a space on which T acts uh, trivially is nothing other than what I'm about to write down. So it's a very easy thing to compute. And so the point is we have something we wish to compute and we have given an injection into a ring which is easy to compute. Yeah? And then of course the question becomes, well, what is the image? Okay. So that is so let me just write that now. Okay, so the T action It's just the ordinary cohomology, but then you just enrich the coefficients. Okay? It's just because the, the, the action is trivial. There's, no, there's nothing, uh, the, the group and the manifold aren't interacting at all. Okay? So in that sense, it's, it's, it's very simple. And if you assume some things about the fixed points, it will be even better than this, and I will write that momentarily. Okay, so... Uh, ah, yes, okay, so it could be, it could be, you can arrange it to be almost whatever you want, if, if you, I, if, if you ask, yeah, if you ask it in the most general setting, you know, what could MT be? Well, of course I can arrange it to be whatever you wish. It could be arbitrarily bad in terms of topology, yeah? But in the examples I care about, <laughs> MT will be nothing other than a collection of finitely many points. Yeah, that, that is, that, so, so that, is why, um, that, that is why I focus on this, because in the cases I care about, this is, it's not just that I have the fixed points, it's in fact that the fixed points are topologically trivial. So, uh, but of course in general, it could be whatever, it could be anything. Okay, so, uh, so 